A quick heads up here, there isn't a large amount of info on the Great War and the Resource Wars in the modern Fallout games, so this video is going to explore the whole story using a mix of current Fallout lore, info from the Fallout Bible, and original two games. I know, I know, it's not exactly canon anymore, but I think the Bible and original games provide a lot of interesting details to the stories, and is what Bethesda's modern Fallout games take its inspiration from. Anyways, with that done, sit down, grab your popcorn, and relax. Because this is gonna be a nice one. When the average person talked about the Great War in pre-war America, they would assume you were talking about the First World War of 1914. In the post-apocalyptic hellscape that makes up the wastelands of modern-day America, that name has taken on a completely different meaning to the average survivor. Nowadays, that old world name refers to the day that changed the world forever, October 23rd, 2077. The day the world's nuclear arsenals were unleashed on its unsuspecting populations, killing billions in an instant and taking countless more lives in the months and years that followed. But before I dive too deep into that fateful day, I think it's only fair that I enlighten everyone on just how it all started, and what caused everything to go so wrong so quickly. In the 21st century, people awoke from the American dream. Years of consumption led to shortages of every major resource. The entire world unraveled. Peace became a distant memory. It is now the year 7. We stand on the brink of total war. And I am afraid. For myself. For my wife. For my infant son. Because if my time in the army taught me one thing, It's that war... War never changes. If you spend any time walking around the wastes, it becomes pretty obvious that there are two major players who are at fault for the end of the world as we know it. The two largest empires in the world at the time of the war. The United States, a formerly democratic country with strong ideals that had been corrupted by the powers of big government, resource hoarding, and authoritarian order. There was also the People's Republic of China, a communist state with a massive high technology center and a large population of loyal citizens. Both these nations couldn't be more different from one another in their founding ideals and principles. However, due to a severe lack of resources such as food, water, and fossil fuels, they would both succumb to the same crippling societal changes, morphing these two nations into a mirror image of each other. While on the surface, they both promoted their individual cultures and philosophies, but over time, due to rampant corruption and widespread desperation, they would both begin morphing into aggressive, authoritarian, greedy, and overall desperate nations, with leadership that was willing to do anything to keep the power they hold. You could say they're like two sides of the same coin, distinctly unique on the surface, though when it comes down to it, they still hold the same inherent values as one another. The Great War didn't just happen out of nowhere, but was the final culmination of a decades-long war between the Chinese and American forces. These conflicts were fought over the quickly diminishing resource of fossil fuels, with the main target being oil. Those good old-fashioned liquid dinosaur bones that run the modern world. By the year 2077, these abundant reserves of oil had become a luxury, only being used by the wealthy and governments of the world. There would supposedly be a documentary that released in 2052, which showcased the dried up oil fields of Texas, showing the average American just how dire their situation really was. Most people were unaware of how scarce the resources had become, due to a large-scale government propaganda campaign which hid the truth. With the Texas oil fields drying up, one of the last known series of large-scale oil wells were located in the American state of Alaska. This quickly became a highly contested area between the great powers of the world. On one hand, America was drowning financially, incurring an obscene national debt, but all things considered, due to the oil, they were better off than most. They would never again have enough fossil fuels to power the whole country, like the old days, but they made sure their reserves could support their military campaigns. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, they weren't so lucky. The Republic of China wasn't blessed with the massive oil reserves the US held control of, generally being considered a resource-poor nation. Even with this lack of raw materials, they managed to surpass the Soviet Union, becoming the most powerful communist nation in the world, rivaling even the US at the time. These two hungry nations would live in relative peace for a time, only engaging in political conflicts rather than military, but as their hunger for resources grew, the peace wouldn't last. I'm going to play a quote by Kellogg talking about his life, but I think it perfectly sums up the mentality of most pre-war people who survived the war, trying to make it in the immediate years following 2077. The thing about happiness is, is you only know you had it 
when it's gone. I mean, you, you may think to yourself that you're happy, but uh, you don't really believe it. Focus on that petty bullshit or next job or whatever. It's only looking back by comparison with what comes after that you really understand that's what happiness felt like. April 2052 was the official beginning of the famous resource wars, following the European Commonwealth's invasion of the Middle East. This was in response to the lack of supply and drastically increasing cost of oil. By the year 2060, the massive oil reserves of the Middle East, the largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world, had run dry. Completely running out of oil to extract, being forced to shut down all their wells and cease all exports. This was catastrophic for the Middle East, sending it into absolute chaos. At the same time, the nations of the Middle East were fighting a brutal war against the European Commonwealth. The conflict brought all involved nations to ruin, and in the end, with the loss of oil reserves, the war would only end up being a complete failure, bringing all involved even closer to the brink of complete disaster. The nations of Europe would inevitably fall into a civil war, slowly tearing each other apart. While Europe and the Middle East were holding on to power for dear life, comparatively North America had it pretty easy due to their local oil reserves, but ultimately, this would only push back the inevitable by a few years at most. The continent may have plenty of oil for now, but that didn't mean things were easy for your average citizen. Back in 2052, in a further attempt to delay the inevitable, the US would place sanctions on their southern neighbor, which was promptly followed by a full-blown invasion of the United Mexican state in a desperate attempt to secure their dwindling oil reserves. The invasion wasn't treated as a full-blown annexation, but was focused on occupying strategic targets, leaving the rest of the war-torn country to fend for themselves while being forced to pay to send oil north to the US. It wouldn't stop here though. In 2059, the Anchorage front line had been created. This was an aggressive move, but ultimately was done as a precautionary measure to protect their last major oil wells located in the state of Alaska. Part of this front line was set to be situated on the massive Trans-Alaskan oil pipeline that ran through their neighbor Canada's land. Initially, there was strong pushback over the request from the Canadian Parliament, but as the negotiations dragged on, the request had turned into a demand, pressuring officials to back down and begrudgingly allow permanent military installations along the pipeline. Tensions would settle between the neighbors for a few years, until in 2066, a surprise attack by the Chinese army was launched against Alaska. Following the sudden invasion, the US would pressure the Canadian government to allow full access for American troops in their territory, souring relations even further, causing Canadian citizens to become bitter and hostile towards their southern neighbor. By the time the bombs dropped in 2077, Canada had been fully annexed into the US, incorporating their land into the country as territories, which wouldn't allow their citizens any form of government representation. All right, let's jump back in time a little bit here. To make things even worse for America, in 2053, the so-called New Plague had arrived on the shores of the US, infecting the continent in a wild blitzkrieg. This illness was dangerous and often deadly, with symptoms ranging from profuse sweating, graduating all the way up to external hemorrhaging, which was soon followed by death. Within a year of its arrival, the entirety of the US was locked down under emergency quarantine measures. The government would use the chaos and fear to further instill their anti-communist propaganda. They would post warnings against the virus, promoting isolationism. The US government also attempted to claim that a symptom of the new plague was socialist thoughts, also encouraging all citizens to register their names so the government could help protect them against the disease. All citizens were instructed to contact a disaster relief post if they showed symptoms, where they would be registered and hopefully treated. Some evidence points towards the registry being a clever way to track known communist sympathizers, making them easier to find and promptly imprison. The American defense contractor, the West Tech Corporation, was by their own efforts, spearheading the research to discover a cure. West Tech was a strong candidate for this position. With their previous research on the X-277 magnetic rail cannon, they proved that their research and development facility was staffed with some of the best minds in the country. They set up a new facility, the West Tech Research Facility, mainly dedicated to the cause of finding a cure. In the end, the scientists would be unsuccessful in their research efforts, with the virus being too difficult to treat. This research would later help the company be picked to work on a new project for the American government. In 2017, in 1973, West Tech was contracted by the US government to develop the Pan Immunity Viren. This project would begin with good intentions, attempting to create an all-in-one cure for all biochemical weapons that they feared the Chinese might use on their citizens. Scientists were able to develop a project that managed to provide immunity to genetic damage, but there was a side effect. The test subject grew significantly larger muscle masses and gained the ability to regenerate new cells. Upon this discovery, the manager overseeing the project immediately scrapped the pan immunity virus in favor of the new, more nefarious project. This would develop into the forced evolutionary virus, focused on creating the perfect super soldier to fight the US's battles, leaving the American public to suffer the horrible fate of the new plague 
with no hope for a cure in the foreseeable future. Even before the end of the world was deemed inevitable, after the beginning of the Europe-Middle East War, the US government had begun planning for the worst case scenario. There was a multitude of contingency plans they had put into action, with the most well-known of these being Project Safe House. This was a large-scale construction project that began in 2054, focusing on the creation of underground vaults to house a portion of the American population, protecting them in the case of a nuclear strike. Unfortunately, with the government basically running out of money, funding the project with government bonds that were likely never to be paid back, they would only be able to protect a small portion of their total population. There were at least 122 vaults that were constructed across the country, with the largest of them being designated to only hold up to a maximum of 1,000 people only housing 0.1% of the total population. Regardless of the limited space, the government still spent an exuberant amount of money on building these shelters, costing hundreds of billions of dollars each. These projects were spearheaded by the government contractor Vault-Tec, also known as the famous creators of the Vault Boy, whose iconic memorabilia is littered across the wastes of America even 200 years later. In 2063, most of the vaults will wrap up construction and begin practice drilling the population. These were done so frequently that it had caused the American population to begin showing up less and less, creating a so-called the boy who cried wolf effect, which would cause fewer to show up on that inevitable doomsday, saving even fewer than expected. Maybe those people were the lucky ones. Considering the vaults would mostly end up being human testing grounds for the government's heinous experiments, the very same government officials who had authorized these horrible experiments have been siphoning funds from taxpayers to create their own private escape from the apocalypse. This group of individuals went by another name, one that was only whispered in the shadows of the old world for fear of discovery. They were known as the Enclave, a secret organization dedicated to preserving the US government in the event of a war, having their main base located on an old oil rig off the coast of California, where they housed some of the richest and most powerful of Americans, including the current president at the time. There was also Robert Edwin House of Robco, who put forward a plan to stop the destruction of his home Nevada, installing nuclear disarmament and defense systems, which is ironic considering he as a private citizen, in the end, managed to save more lives than the entirety of the US government. Remember that invasion of Alaska that China was desperately attempting? Well, the fight had gotten pretty intense, with the Chinese forces taking control of even the state capital Anchorage, and more importantly, their oil refineries. The invasion would last almost 11 years, being only stopped by total and utter nuclear annihilation. Before this, though, the two armies were at a stalemate in the frozen tundra of Alaska. With every step one army took forward, the other would push forward somewhere else. The two nations would come up with their own technologies to break this stalemate. The Chinese would focus on stealth and espionage, tasking their scientists to begin a full-body stealth suit, which was able to completely hide a potential spy on an espionage mission. While on the other hand, Americans focused on military might, designing a heavy power armor suit, a futuristic body armor that was powered by fusion cores. These armors allowed even the weakest soldier to charge into battle, carrying heavy weapons like miniguns and missile launchers, bringing these weapons to locations where tanks and planes were unable to reach, giving their armies a large strategic advantage over the outmaneuvered Chinese forces. This advantage, thanks to power armor, was the deciding factor during the recapturing of Anchorage by the US Army in 2077. The Alaskan Front was the main battlefield for the Sino-American War, but there was another less talked about battle. The American invasion of the Chinese mainland, a naval invasion that took place in 2074, fueled by the Marine Corps and their highly experienced soldiers. Unfortunately, due to the overextended supply lines and a lack of troop morale, the invasion would be quickly bogged down reaching a stalemate. Regardless of the general lack of progress, it did a great job at wasting the Chinese forces' scarce resources. With the loss of Anchorage and the invasion of the homeland, the Chinese Republic had been pushed to their limits, bringing the threat of total atomic annihilation even closer than ever. On the fateful morning of October 23rd, 2077, the world fell into an unstoppable nuclear hellfire, turning most major cities into a melted pit of steel and glass within minutes, completely unrecognizable from their former selves. The vast majority of the human population had been killed in the blasts and subsequent radiation. But like the rad roaches we're so familiar with, the human race managed to adapt and survive. They were bruised, battered, and irradiated but they did their best to persevere and survive the new world they had created. Within 200 years, they would have new cities and even nations built out of the rubble of the old world, including but not limited to the Brotherhood of Steel, the New California Republic, Caesar's Legion, and many, many more. The rebuilding of the US truly was a testament to humanity's ability to survive even the worst odds. I guess only time will tell how our destiny unfolds in this crazy world, but we as humans, will always try our hardest to control the inevitably uncontrollable outcome. Thanks for watching.